Let's go over the warm-up for Biochem 17. First question, which cytokine inhibits T helper 2 cells? That's interferon gamma. Next, what is the skin lesion finding associated with bacillus anthracis infection? So it's going to be a black eschar with necrosis surrounded by an edematous ring caused by lethal factor and edema factor. So here's an image of a skin lesion in a patient infected with bacillus anthracis. And the last one, what are the common causes of ARDS? So the causes include shock, infection, toxic gas inhalation, acute pancreatitis, aspiration, heroin overdose, and high concentrations of oxygen for extended periods of time. So now let's move on to the lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our step one video on fat soluble vitamins and antioxidants. Guys, I'm not sure if you know this, but your body is a temple. Now, as a chief educator, my contract requires me to maintain my chiseled body, but I think I've been a little deficient on my vitamin intake lately. So, to remedy this, I've been pounding the vitamins, drinking my antioxidant protein smoothies, and juicing my brains out. Man, I think I'm starting to see a difference. I'm feeling great, my eyesight is amazing. Man, vitamins are super. All right, let's get on with that lecture. So, vitamins as a whole are actually quite high yield for step one, probably even a five-star topic. I would expect you to have at least two or three questions on vitamins in general. Now first, what are the fat-soluble vitamins? Well, remember ADEC, A-D-E-K. Now, now that we're talking about all the fat-soluble vitamins, it's also pretty important to keep in the back of your mind that any fat malabsorption disease, maybe something like cystic fibrosis or pancreatic insufficiency, can potentially result in deficiencies in these vitamins. So, think of diseases or pathology that may affect the ileum where absorption of these vitamins occur. All right, so the first vitamin we're going to talk about is vitamin D. And vitamin D is a complex but very important vitamin uh, in the body. And though we refer to it as a, a vitamin, its structure is actually quite similar to steroids like testosterone, cholesterol, and even cortisol. Now first, uh, um, we humans will get our vitamin D by ingesting it in the diet. And also, we can synthesize certain forms of vitamin D uh, in the skin when the skin is exposed to sunlight. And then we actually convert vitamin D into several different forms, especially in the kidney. So just saying vitamin D actually doesn't tell us very much. You need to know the different forms and names of vitamin D. So first we have ergocalciferol, so this is D2. And this is the ingested uh, form of vitamin D, and this is usually from plants. Next we have colocalciferol, so this is actually vitamin D3. Now this is what's added to fortified milk. It's also what is synthesized in our sun-exposed skin. Now, in the liver, vitamin D3 and D2 are converted by the enzyme 25-hydroxylase to 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So this is also referred to as 25-OH uh, vitamin D or uh, calcidiol. Now, uh, this is what is measured most often when we're actually checking patients for their vitamin D status. And then in the kidney, uh, that 25-OH vitamin D is further hydroxylated to 1,25 or 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, sometimes just referred to as 125-OH vitamin D, or uh, uh, calcitriol. Now this is the physiologically active form of vitamin D. So now that we know the different names of vitamin D, what does all this do? Well, vitamin D increases calcium uptake uh, in the intestine by increasing the expression of calcium-binding protein. Now, it also works in the intestine uh, to increase the absorption of phosphate and magnesium as well. It's also going to stimulate parathyroid hormone-dependent reabsorption of calcium in the distal tubules of the kidney. And it's also going to stimulate uh, the bone reabsorption when necessary along with PTH. So all three of these things are going to increase serum calcium. Next, let's cover some vitamin D deficiency uh, and resistance. So how does this all occur? Well, this occurs by one of four mechanisms. So one, you get inadequate uh, dietary vitamin D. You can get impaired hydroxylation by the liver to make 25-hydroxyvitamin D. You can also have impaired hydroxylation by the kidneys, so you can't make that 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Or you get some in-organ insensitivity to vitamin D. So those are the three big ways that we get vitamin D deficiency, so to speak. So what's the end result of a vitamin D deficiency or resistance? Well, you get rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. Now these are both demineralization uh, problems uh, of the bone. Now why does this happen? Well, let's think about this. Let's say you don't eat any vitamin D. And so without vitamin D, you can't absorb calcium very well and phosphate very well uh, in the intestine. So as that serum calcium level drops, the parathyroid glands start to notice this. And they start pumping out parathyroid hormone, so PTH. So that PTH is going to increase the serum calcium by breaking down bone. PTH also works to decrease serum phosphate. So not only are you breaking down bone, but you don't actually have adequate amounts of calcium and phosphorus to produce 
to produce really good strong bone either. So this results in that bone demineralization or softening of the bones. Now patients will also have bone tenderness, they're going to have muscle weakness, they're going to have skeletal deformities. You'll often see uh, x-rays of bowing of the legs uh, with rickets. Uh, you're going to have growth problems in pediatric patients, pathologic fractures as well, and even dental problems. Now one important note is that breast milk does not generally have adequate amounts of vitamin D. So most infants are going to get uh, potentially enough uh, sunlight to counteract this, but it's still recommended that vitamin D supplementation be given to infants who are exclusively breastfed. Now what if you take too much vitamin D? Now this doesn't occur uh, by getting too much sun. It really just occurs when patients take too much of their vitamin D supplementation. So patients may become hypercalcemic, which may uh, lead to our previous conversations about hypercalcemia, those stones, those bones, those groans, and the psychiatric overtones. Now one other rare instance of vitamin D toxicity can arise from sarcoidosis. So here we uh, are going to see an increase in the conversion of that 25 hydroxy vitamin D to that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So the macrophages present in granulomas can actually increase this conversion. So patients with sarcoidosis might actually have hypercalcemia because of this. All right, so that's enough about vitamin D. Let's move on to vitamin K. Uh, so what is the principal role of vitamin K? So it is involved in the post-translational modification of various clotting factors uh, where it's going to serve as a coenzyme in the carboxylation of certain glutamic acid residues present in these proteins. So you have to have vitamin K in order to have normal uh, clotting systems. And it's also interesting that vitamin K is actually synthesized by our intestinal flora. So you have to have normal intestinal flora to produce uh, adequate amounts of vitamin K. So which clotting factors are involved? Well, this is going to include protein C and S, prothrombin, and the clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Remember that one mnemonic that we've uh, potentially used in the past, DISCO started in 1972, which isn't true, but hey, uh, it's going to help us remember something. So that's 10, 9, 7, and 2 for that 1972. And then C and S in DISCO is how you remember that as well. So these are the vitamin K dependent clotting factors, which are also the clotting factors that would be uh, decreased if you were to take uh, warfarin or coumadin. Now, another uh, high yield topic is the relationship between vitamin K and newborns. So newborns can actually have problems with hemorrhage. And the reason that newborns have uh, this problem is that they have a sterile gut. Therefore, they don't have the appropriate intestinal flora to produce vitamin K. And breast milk only provides maybe a fifth, if even that, of the needed vitamin K. So uh, it's recommended that newborns actually receive a single IM or intramuscular dose of vitamin K at birth. And that should really carry them over until they actually get enough bacteria in their gut and they start producing their own vitamin K. Now, what's going to cause a vitamin K deficiency? Well, we don't uh, really have to eat a whole bunch of vitamin K because our gut flora is already producing it. So usually it's medications that cause our problem. So we've talked about one already, Coumadin. Uh, Coumadin is a vitamin K antagonist that we often use uh, as an anticoagulant. So if you use too much of that, your vitamin K is going to go too low and you're going to get too much anticoagulation. But also think about anticonvulsants. Phenytoin is an example. Uh, also antibiotics that are going to wipe out your gut bacteria. Don't see this happen very often, but you could theoretically uh, remove enough of the right gut flora and then you're not going to have enough of that vitamin K synthesis. All right, moving on to our next vitamin, let's move on to vitamin A. So vitamin A is another one of the fat-soluble uh, vitamins, and it's going to include several compounds. So that's going to be retinol and retinal. Uh, so retinol is uh, especially useful uh, to the eye and the immune system. It's also great in maintenance of epithelial cells and mucus-secreting cells. You can also have something called beta-carotene, and we all know about beta-carotene, vitamin carrots, uh, which is cleaved in the intestine to yield two molecules of retinol. And then retinoic acid. So retinoic acid actually can't be reduced. It's not very usable in the body, but it's usable, uh, very usable for treatment of certain diseases. We'll talk about it here in a minute. So dietary vitamin A is important for uh, some normal functions in the body, but when do we use it clinically? Well, most of the time, we're using vitamin A to treat acne. So tretinoin is a very commonly used topical agent that's used for mild to moderate acne. The oral form of vitamin A that's used uh, for more severe acne is called isotretinoin. It's kind of a severe uh, uh, medication. Now these vitamin A drugs act to decrease the size and secretion of sebaceous glands. That tends to improve acne. Another treatment worth mentioning is that vitamin A can be uh, useful in the treatment of measles, particularly in third world countries. You don't see measles very often around here. And it can also be useful in the treatment of AML, acute myelogenous leukemia, especially uh, the M3 subtype. Now, what are some of the signs of deficiency of vitamin A? Well, you can have night blindness, because we've talked about before how vitamin A is very important in uh, vision. Uh, you can have uh, xerothalmia, which is a pathologic dryness of the conjunctiva, and a cornea resulting in corneal ulceration and even blindness. Uh, if uh, you can see corneal ulcerations on a test question, 
definitely put vitamin A a deficiency on your list of things to think about. You can also have uh, keratol malacia, uh, which is wrinkling and clouding of the cornea as well. And you can also have something called uh, bitok uh, uh, spots, which are very kind of dry, silvery, gray plaques, and that's going to be in the bulbar conjunctiva as well. So a lot of eye things with vitamin A deficiency. Now, what are the signs of hypervitaminosis uh, A? So too much vitamin A, vitamin A toxicity. So you can have headache, you can have nausea, vomiting, stupor. Uh, you can have increase in intracranial pressure, and this is pseudotumor cerebri. Now, the skin can also have some problems. You can get very dry and puritic skin. Now, too much of, not vitamin A, but beta carotene can actually cause a benign orange coloration of the skin. So too much beta carotene makes you look orange, but it actually does not lead to a vitamin A toxicity. So it's actually relatively safe. You just look kind of silly. Now, the liver can uh, become enlarged and possibly cirrhotic with vitamin A toxicity. You can get bone and joint pain. Uh, so anyone that's on isotretinoin uh, for their acne, you want to definitely monitor for these types of symptoms. Alopecia can happen as well. Now, one important correlation to vitamin A toxicity is the story of maybe an Eskimo or a hunter that's killed a polar bear. I know this is a little weird. And if they, if they eat a lot of the liver of a polar bear, soon they might discover uh, problems like a headache or increased intracranial pressure, other neurological symptoms. And you might be asking, well, well, what does it have to do with vitamin A? Well, strangely enough, there's extremely high levels of vitamin A found in the livers of polar bears. So be careful when you eat polar bear. Uh, next, so we have, in which patient populations is vitamin A supplementation a particularly bad idea? Well, uh, if you're pregnant, uh, you definitely don't want to take vitamin A because of the risk of teratogenesis. So this is why you always want to ask a woman of childbearing age if she is pregnant or plans to becoming pregnant before you ever think about prescribing uh, any form of vitamin A. We generally get a negative pregnancy test uh, even before we think about using especially things like isotretinoin. All right, moving on, vitamin E, uh, also known as alpha tocopherol. Uh, so you do have to remember some of these extra uh, monikers here. Now, its pr primary function is as an antioxidant. So it prevents non-enzymatic oxidation uh, of cell com uh, components by oxygen-free radicals. So it's especially important for red blood cells. So it helps to prevent free radicals from damaging red blood cells and even other cells as well. Now, what is associated with a vitamin E deficiency? Well, first you're going to see hemolytic anemia. We just talked about that because it's, there's going to be less protection for those RBCs. You can get a spinal cerebellar a degeneration that can result in ataxia. You can get peripheral neuropathy and even proximal muscle weakness as well. All right, guys, so that's going to be our fat-soluble vitamins, our uh, D, K, A, E. I remember ADEC, though. Uh, and now we said vitamin E is an antioxidant. Now, what other substances in your body are antioxidants as well? Well, vitamin C is a great antioxidant. Uh, so we're going to actually go ahead and talk about vitamin C here, even though it is a water-soluble vitamin uh, rather than a fat-soluble vitamin. But we're trying to put most of our antioxidants right here. So vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, uh, and so what is the main metabolic reaction that vitamin C is involved in? Well, it's hydroxylation of a prolyl and lysyl residues of collagen. So hydroxylation for proline uh, residues and for uh, lysine residues. And this is uh, very important in the formation of collagen. So if you're deficient in vitamin C, you're not going to be able to make collagen very well. And we'll see in a second why that results in the symptoms of scurvy. But there are a few other things that vitamin C does as well. So it's also required in the conversion of dopamine to a norepinephrine. So dopamine beta hydroxylase needs vitamin C in order to make a norepinephrine. Additionally, vitamin C circulates in the blood and serves as an antioxidant, which helps protect those red blood cells. It's going to facilitate iron absorption in the gut. So vitamin C will uh, help keep iron in its reduced state, which makes it easier for the gut to absorb. So that's why we tell people to take iron with orange juice. So what are the major signs of vitamin C deficiency, or scurvy, always makes me think of pirates. So uh, you're gonna have maybe sore, spongy gums, you're gonna have loose teeth, you're gonna have fragile blood vessels, and that can cause even hemorrhages. You're gonna even get to the point where you're getting swollen joints and bleeding into the joints, so hemarthrosis. You're gonna have impaired wound healing and also anemia. All right, guys, so that's going to bring us to the end of our fat-soluble vitamins, uh, plus vitamin C. Uh, so go ahead and answer the end of session questions. We'll go through those together. All right, first question here, what vitamin in excess can cause hypercalcemia? Remember, that's going to be vitamin D. Next question, what are the symptoms of vitamin A toxicity? So remember, chronic toxicity can cause visual impairment. You can have fatigue, ataxia, headache. You can get increased intracranial pressure, which I think is the most interesting one there. You can also have dry skin, alopecia, or, or hair loss. Uh, uh, you can also get some liver problems and some arthralgias. And remember that retinoic acid uh, is very highly teratogenic, so vitamin A, so we don't give anything like isotretinoin uh, to any females who might become pregnant or who are pregnant. Next, 
what clinical features uh, would lead you to suspect that a patient has scurvy? Um, so first, those sore, spongy gums and loose teeth, fragile blood vessels that cause a lot of hemorrhage, swollen joints, so that hemarthrosis, impaired wound healing, and anemia. Next, vitamin C is necessary for the hydroxylation of which amino acids in collagen synthesis? Remember, that's going to be proline and lysine. And final question here, what is the other name for vitamin E? Remember, that's going to be alpha tocopherol. All right, that's it for the end of session quiz. We have a couple rapid fire facts. Uh, first here, treatment of choice for rickets or osteomalacia, that's going to be vitamin D. Patient with swollen gums, poor wound healing, bleeding mucous membranes, spots on the skin, uh, or if they have a pirate on their shoulder, think of scurvy. Uh, so that's going to be vitamin C deficiency. All right, guys, that's going to bring us to the end of Biochem 17. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.